Yeah, it's great to see you. Who's been enjoying the sunshine? Isn't it wonderful? Who's been out in the garden? Who's now going, ooh, like that? <laughs> yeah, you should have seen Jackie and I trying to get out of bed this morning. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Anyway, um, it's great to see you. Welcome. Uh, just to say, Simon and Fiona send their love. They celebrated their 22nd anniversary yesterday up in Edinburgh, which is lovely. And uh, Simon's speaking at Victory Hill Church this morning. So just remember him and remember them as he blesses them as that church goes, goes on now from strength to strength. Uh, Rob Lewis is going to be speaking this morning, so we're looking forward to that. Oh, he missed the cheer. He's uh, Bring him back. Yeah, when he comes in, give him a cheer in a minute when he appears. Um, why don't we stand together? I thought, uh, I'd, let me just read a scripture. Uh, Isaac and the team are going to lead us as we worship together. There'll be uh, a work for the children and the young people a bit later on as well. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? That's one of the phrases that Jesus used about himself. He talked about himself. Who do people say I am? But who, who's the Son of Man? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Elijah was one of the prophets. Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. What about you, he said. Who do you say I am? Now, we come in different ways this morning. Jesus says to us, who do you say I am? Some of you are saying, oh, I'm just finding out a bit more about Jesus. Others of you would say, I've known Jesus for a long time. Who do you say I am? He says to us, just this morning as we come, we're coming to worship. We're not just coming to a club. We're not just having a, a nice hour and a half together. We're coming to someone. Who do you say I am? Simon, Peter, one of the disciples answered, You are the Christ. You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Who do you say this morning? As we come into worship, as Isaac and the team lead us, the Lord says, who do you say I am? Let the response of our hearts, for those of us who already know, let's begin to say, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven you. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Lord, we thank you for the privilege, for the joy of coming this morning. And for many of us here, we're able to say, you're the Christ. You are our Savior. You're the Son of the living God. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we worship you. Lord, we thank you that you've promised you will build your church. And we, we say today, Lord, build your church. And yet the echo replies, I will build my church. And we say, build your church, Lord. You say, I will build my church. And so we welcome you, Lord. We, we thank you, Lord. It's not about us being here and then you turn up. You're already here and, and we are turning up, Lord. And we worship you together. And I pray for anyone today who... He's just saying, I just want to find out more. I just want to look and watch. I pray that those here would just feel so welcome, would feel so at peace and feel at home, but that, Lord, they would begin to know and understand, you're the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. So, Lord, we give you this morning, we give you our whole time together. I pray that you'd lead us by your Holy Spirit, because we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Yeah. Amen. Let's worship together. Yeah, we've got a lot to be thankful for, haven't we, church? So let's, let's not hold back this morning. Let's give him our thanks. Let's give him our praise for all that he is and all that he's done for us. Amen.
We worship the God who was. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. And there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. We sing, we sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on the cross, and he rose up from the grave, my God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet We're gonna shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place We won't be quiet We'll shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We're gonna shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We're gonna shout out your praise. Because we were the beggars. Because we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven. Accepted, redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise Cause we were the beggars Now we're royalty We were the prisoners Now we're running free We are forgiven, accepted Redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet We're gonna shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place We won't be quiet We're gonna shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet we're gonna shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We're gonna shout out your praise. Our praises to him, shall we? Thank you, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for salvation. Lord, I want to thank you that you hear when I pray, Lord, and you lift me out of my troubles. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness.
together we do ready to meet you on that final day. Lord, we look into that day. Let there be joy in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Lord. I don't have to make an appointment, Lord. Thank you. There's no guard at the door fending me off, Lord. But I can come into your presence just as I am. Hallelujah. My son, who set my words and stopped my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. And if you call out for insight, you cry aloud for understanding. And if you look for it as for silver, and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God, for the God gives wisdom. Stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I wonder how he could love me. A sinner. singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for My sins. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. And he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. And we're singing. Yes. 
Jesus, you are indeed beautiful. Mm. You're beautiful beyond mm. description. Yes. Jesus, you are the first. You are the living one. You are holy, beautiful, beyond description. But I thank you, we thank you today that we can know you. Yes. We know you. I know you personally. You're my saviour. You're my lord. You're my friend, my brother. Yes. You are beautiful, beyond description. And I love you. And I worship you. And I adore you. Jesus, we honor your name. Jesus, we honor your name, Lord. Yours is the highest name of all. Jesus, all power and glory belong to you. You're the King of glory, and you're strong and mighty, and over all heavens and earth, you are God above, you're the King our hearts praise, we're honored in one name, it's Jesus our Lord.
You're the King of glory. You're strong and mighty. And over all the heavens and earth, you are God above. You're the King our hearts praise. We're honoring one name. Jesus our Lord, Jesus our King. Hallowed be, hallowed be. giving of the whole of ourselves, isn't it? We don't just come and sing some songs. We are declaring his lordship. And uh, that's very real for us in this Western context, particularly and in terms of our money. So many of you will give through the bank already, and we thank God for that. Um, but one of the things we do is just pass the basket around as part of our worship. And even if you're giving through the bank, you're not putting cash in today. Just give thanks to God for everything that comes from Him. And covenant in your heart again to say, Lord, I'm giving of all of myself. Everything I have is from you. That's what we've been just declaring this morning, isn't it? His lordship, His kingship. Everything I have is from you. And just, just in your own heart say, Lord, am I holding back? Not just my finance, but just am I holding back? Show me if I'm holding back, where I'm holding back. Lord, I, I want to come again to you. I want to give all that I am to you today. So as the, the baskets go round and as we continue in worship, let's just, uh, just test our hearts in that way. Just come before him. Let's worship together. All who are we come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy. As deep cries out to deep, we sing, come Lord Jesus, come, come Lord Jesus, come. Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow be washed
washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep we sing come Lord Jesus come we sing come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus come As deep cries out to deep, as deep cries out to deep, as deep cries out to deep, we sing, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit. Let it be Jesus, the first name that I call. Let it be Jesus, my song inside the storm. need another for me to live is Christ for me to live is Christ God I breathe your name Let it be Jesus. 
Jesus from the rising of the sun let it be Jesus when all is said and done I'll never need another Jesus, there's no other for me to live is Christ for me to live is Christ God, I breathe your name above everything let it be let it be Jesus Should I ever be abandoned, or should I ever be acclaimed? Should I ever be surrounded by the fire and the flame? There's a name I will remember. There's a name. us, you sustain us, you deliver us and redeem us, Lord, and you lift us to your side. Lord, we thank you. All we need is found in you, Lord God, and we thank you for showing yourselves to us, Lord. Thank you for dwelling inside of us by your Spirit. When I survey. When I survey.
his hands, his feet. So. Lord, when we survey the cross, when we look at what the cross has done for us, what you have done for us, we can count nothing to our gain, mm. Lord. We can only count what you have done, Lord, your righteousness, your blood, Lord, your sinlessness for our sinfulness, Lord, as we, uh, as we come to your word in just a moment, Lord, would you remind us constantly, Lord, of what you have done for us, Lord, and uh, how little we deserved it, Lord. And that stirs our praise, our prayer, yeah. and our living for you uh, in this life. And we will praise um, and worship forever into the next. So thank you, Lord. Amen. You can take a seat. Thanks, Isaac and band, very much. 
Welcome. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jordan. Thank you. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure alongside Mark to uh, serve on the staff and the leadership team of this wonderful church, uh, New Life Church. So I want to first welcome, again, any visitors, any uh, first-timers, anyone who's only maybe been coming for a little while. Um, if that's you, you're very welcome. Um, and if you haven't taken one already, uh, then there are some welcome packs uh, in the brown paper bags in the foyer. Um, so please take one if you haven't had one yet. And uh, just a reminder about the men's breakfast that's coming up in a few weeks' time, the 1st of June, Saturday. Um, I think that's going to be here. Um, and it's for everyone. Uh, Simon said that it's from ages 13 to 113. Um, so if you fit within those age brackets, uh, then you are welcome to come. Uh, the sign-up is already available. So uh, on, the, on the website, um, on our Save the Date page, there's a link. It's also on the church suite um, that you can sign up there. If that's all too technical, that's fine. Give the office a call. Uh, don't give the office a call. We don't have a phone line at the moment. <laughs> give Tracy's number a call, the, the New Life Mobile a call, or WhatsApp one of us and we'll get you booked in. Um, just an update on that actually, whilst I'm giving notices, we should all be up and running again by the 20th of May. Okay, so we have, uh, we do have internet, we just don't have the phone at the moment, um, so we're sort of fudging our way along uh, until OpenReach can get out to us. Um, so that's that. Um, also in the save the dates that you would have taken either in paper or you've seen it on um, the website, on the 16th of May there was um, a Burundi night down in, uh, in Swindon, I was going to say Sweden, that was Eurovision, um, Swindon, um, where uh, Donna Bloomfield was going to share about what's been going on in Burundi uh, the past year or so. Unfortunately, uh, and let's keep uh, Donna in our prayers, she's had a really um, bad uh, back flare-up, something to do with a couple of the uh, vertebrae. I think she's got a herniated disc, is that right, Mark? Um, so she could really do with our prayers, so please keep her in your prayers. That means she's had to cancel um, this sort of night of sharing about Burundi, and she thinks she may have to delay her getting back to Burundi, because she may very well need surgery. So uh, please keep her in your prayers. And finally, before I hand over to Rob, um, Alpha is continuing this Thursday. Um, there's four, four or five, Trace? Five. They've got five on Alpha currently. So pray for them. Um, pray for Rob and Tracy and the team as they, uh, as they lead um, these, uh, hopefully, new converts, but uh, people who are coming to find out more about Jesus um, through this course. So Let's uh, keep them in our prayers, and let's also, let's come and pray for Rob as he comes uh, and joins us to um, preach the Word of God. So Rob, no, come on, I want to lay hands on you. Um, thank you, Lord, for Rob. Thank you for his, uh, his father um, hood to this church, Lord, his eldership to this church. We thank you that um, he serves us so well uh, and cares for us. Uh, Lord, would you bless him? Uh, would his words be only the words that your spirit would want uh, us to hear this morning? Uh, so thank you for him, and please bless him, Lord, as he comes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Go back. Oh, fatherhood of the church, wow. That's my phone. That oh, that's your phone. Yeah. I was wondering, I was thinking, <laughs> this, this is all wrong. That's not what I had on there. Sorry. This is far too far away. I, I was never designed to be this distant from you. Um, we are in the book of Philemon this morning, so while you're turning to that, I will waffle for a moment. <coughs> Did anyone see the Northern Lights? You didn't? Oh, I was so excited. Uh, Tracy will tell you how excited I was. I, I ran in and woke her up. Uh, I, was, I was very excited to see the Northern Lights and I was amazed by them and they were just spectacular. But um, just while we were, just in the morning on Saturday while I was just looking through all these pictures about six o'clock in the morning, bearing in mind I went to bed about three, <laughs> and I'm looking through these and I'm, and I'm sending them to everybody I can. And... and, and uh, on the leadership group, they, they were looking at these pictures, and uh, I was really excited by these pictures and by what had gone on. But actually, Mark put on the leadership team, the heavens declare the glory of God, 
the skies proclaim his glory and the works of his hands. Right? So, as I, was, as I was just reading that, I suddenly realised that on the car journey, and when I'd actually seen these lights in the sky, my first response was, God, you are amazing. God, I love you. And, and I realised as I was speeding along Tatsfield, <laughs> I was within the speed limit, as I was speeding along Tatsfield to get to this dark place to see these things, I was shouting the praise of God. And, and what made me cry was the fact that my first response came from within. Because inside, my spirit is alive to him. And my first response to him about these things that I was seeing in the sky was, God, I love you. I love you. You are so amazing. And that just made me... I was, I was, we were sitting in bed and I started to cry. And I'm thinking, you know, anyway. But, but that's the heart of discipleship. Knowing and loving Christ and your first response to be, I love you. I love you with everything that I am. And one day this flesh that holds me back will go and I will be truly transformed into the likeness of Christ. And that will be a glorious day for me and for you and for everyone. Anyway, and I realise if I don't shout out and scream, and my, my, in the worship I've been shouting, I must learn, don't shout and scream before you come to speak. Because... <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, are we all at Philemon? Good. Because this book of Philemon has three main characters. We've got Paul, the Apostle Paul, and I'm just going to give you a quick breakdown in case you don't know him. Um, his father was a Pharisee. Uh, he was a Hebrew with Roman citizenship. He was a master of uh, Jewish history, religion and law. He spoke Aramaic, Greek and Latin. He went on to become a lawyer and it's thought he was a member of the Sanhedrin, that's the ruling body. He was determined to eradicate Christianity and he was ruthless in the pursuit of that, having people stoned and taken away. Whilst on the road to Damascus to continue destroying the church, he has this amazing encounter with the Lord Jesus and that encounter transforms him forever. He then becomes God's chosen instrument to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God before the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. And he suffers for doing so. Paul was given the opportunity to do extraordinary things in the kingdom of God. The story of Paul is a story of redemption in Jesus Christ and a testimony, a testimony that no one is beyond redemption. Philemon, he's another character in this book. In fact, the letter is written to Philemon. That's why it's called Philemon. Philemon is a Christian and he's a, a wealthy guy. He's wealthy enough to have slaves. Okay? Uh, he hosts the Colossian church, whose letter is also written and taken at the same time, Colossians. He hosts the church in his home. Paul had led Philemon to Christ. So Paul, on one of his journeys to Asia Minor, has led Philemon to Christ, and he's probably discipled him. And he's probably discipled him as well, as their relationship really appears to be very close. Philemon is said to regularly pray for Paul in his ministry, and Philemon loves the church. You could say Paul is sort of aristocratic and well-off, Philemon is uh, sort of middle class but wealthy enough to have slaves. And then the third person in this story is Onesimus. Onesimus is a slave who is owned by Philemon. It's believed that Onesimus has run away and has sought refuge in Rome. Rome's a big city, he could probably hide there quite easily. Onesimus meets Paul while Paul is in prison in Rome. And we're not sure if Onesimus was known to Paul before this encounter, uh, but it's not clear. But it's, but it's clear that they have become good friends 
And in this journey, Paul has led Onesimus to Christ and is discipling him. And he's discipling him really well because Onesimus has completely changed. Uh, So this discipleship that Paul is having with him is producing good results. Paul is doing the right thing now by the law in sending Onesimus back to Philemon. And he sends him back with this letter. So Onesimus is obviously a slave and you would consider him probably to be quite poor. Um, I know I'm not going to go into the, the facts of slavery. You could sell yours anyway, it doesn't matter. So let's read the letter. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, so it'll probably be slightly different to your new um, NIV. Okay. Greetings from Paul. This letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. I'm writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister, Aphia, and to our fellow soldier, Achapias. Archipaeus. I wish they had better names. I've got to meet these people in heaven one day and I'm going to be going... <laughs> I'd, have a, I'd have a good memory for names then. God will see to that. And to the church that meets in your house. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, Because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people. And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That is why I am boldly asking you a a favour of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do. But because of our love, I prefer to simply ask you to consider this as a request from me. Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past, but now he is very useful to uh, is very useful to both of us. I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. I wanted to keep him here with me while I am in chains for preaching the good news. And he would have helped me on your behalf. But I don't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to help because you were willing. Not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while. So that you could have him back forever. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave. For he is a beloved brother. Especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I pull him right in this with my own hand. I will repay it and I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. He already has mentioned it, but... (laughs) Yes, my brother, please do me this favour for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I am confident as I write this letter that you will do what I ask and even more. One more thing. Please prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. If us, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings, so does Mark and Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my co-workers, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. You can just get the heart of his um, 
you can just get the heart of Paul, can't you, in, in what he's saying to Philemon, in what he's urging him to do. Hmm. So we're talking about discipleship in this series. So what does, it, what does it mean, actually, to be a disciple? The Greek term for disciple in the New Testament basically means a student or a learner. You could compare it to um, apprenticeship. If I, want to be an, if I want to be a carpenter, I do an apprenticeship in carpentry and I become a carpenter. If I am a disciple of Jesus, I become like Jesus. That's the heart of discipleship. If I'm a disciple, my aim is to end up like Jesus. My aim is to be more like Jesus in my attitude and my ways. This is of great benefit to me. It's the best. So why wouldn't I want to be more like it? Why wouldn't I want to learn to be more like Jesus? However, Jesus does say quite explicitly about the cost of following him. Discipleship requires a totally committed life. I came across this wonderful quote by a chap called Jonathan Doherty. Uh, he says, I wish I, I wish I'd come up with some of those, but anyway. The more I study God's word and engage in conversations with him, the more I realise how deeply passionate he is about my devotion to him. He wants and deserves every part of me to be in total submission and surrender to him. He desires this not only because he is deserving of it, but because he understands the benefits that such devotion brings to my life and my relationships. Single-minded focus on God produces the fruit of abundant life. Embracing discipleship as our, process, as our process for becoming what God designs us to be. Discipleship focuses on God in the context of relationships. So it focuses on God in the context of our relationship. First with him, then with others. This is our forever changing, forever growing, forever exploring adventure. Discipleship requires relationship. This is the key in understanding the immeasurable value of becoming a disciple of Christ. We were never designed to live in isolation or disconnection from God or others. This is where discipleship takes us out of our comfort zone. But this is ultimately for our own good. In fact, God has mysteriously designed our accountability to one another. That's where it takes us out of our comfort zone because we are accountable to one another. In our accountability in relationships with others to act as a hedge of protection, we need godly teammates. Isn't that great? We need godly teammates. There's some lovely examples of discipleship and relationship from Paul in this letter that we can take note of. I love how he starts this. This is why we need godly teammates, because he starts with prayer and encouragement. We all need prayer. And God knows we all need encouragement at times, eh? Prayer is always important. Covering each other as you think about someone and when you meet. God moves through prayer. He blesses through our prayers. He blesses others. In fact, it's beneficial for both. As you pray, it strengthens your communication with God and it strengthens your relationship with God as well. Encouragement, verse 5, encouragement. We can never have enough encouragement. Sometimes life is hard going, isn't it? And you could be pressed on each side and we can feel we're not making progress in anything. But isn't it refreshing when someone comes alongside and brings a good word to you? Is it? 
<laughs> I don't want you to be quiet. I want you to be enthusiastic this morning, just like I was enthusiastic about the lights in the sky the other day. Because this is good news. Paul says, Paul says this to Philemon, I hear about your love and your faith. Do you know sometimes when we're thinking, oh, do you know what, my faith's a little bit low, it's a little bit low today, and I'm just, oh, I'm not, it's just not, it's not, it's not happening. When someone comes along and says, I love your faith. Wow. <laughs> and I was down here at the moment, but now I'm, I'm being lifted. Paul says, I hear about your love and your faith. Can you imagine Philemon's response? Paul, this great man of Christ, this one that led me to Christ, this one that discipled me, this one that knows all this stuff. He's an intellectual genius. You remember me? You pray for me? Your heart and your love is for me. You hear about the works I'm doing, about the works you're doing for Christ. And you say, I'm the same? That must have lifted Philemon. He must have, he's buttering Philemon up, I know that. <laughs> but actually, he's lifting him in faith. He's lifting him. He's saying, Do you know, remember what it's like to be a Christian. Remember what it is to be a disciple of Jesus. We're in partnership. You're advancing the kingdom, Paul, and so am I. Encouragement strengthens and helps him to carry on. Encouragement to one another is necessary. It's good to encourage one another. We need it. We do need it. It's, we are weak and we need godly encouragement. We need to understand that God does this and is capable of looking after us and loving us and sharing. But we need to be encouraged and inspired by that. We need to look and know that God is for us. We need to remember it, because we forget. Paul also reminds him, when we carry out the things we learn in discipleship, we deepen our understanding of what it is to know Christ and how good that is for us. It works both ways as well. Look at the effect it has on Paul. Your love, your love and encouragement have brought me great joy. See, this encouragement is working both ways now. Paul's investment in his relationship with Philemon, those hours of explaining the gospel to him, are paying off. The gospel has taken a deep root in Philemon's heart. Now, can you imagine what it's like, you know, when you're, when you're discipling someone, when you're sharing with them, suddenly they take all of this on board and it becomes real for them and they just go off and do the stuff that you've taught them. Do you know how encouraging that is? Isn't it wonderful when you see someone you've helped doing really well? <laughs> it's very fulfilling. It fills you with joy. We are here for one another's success. Does that sound familiar? Should do, because we've said it enough. <laughs> Loving one another is part of being a disciple. It's part of it's discipleship. I might run over here a little bit, actually. <laughs> when Paul comes to the reason for this letter, right, so now Paul's coming to the reason for this letter. A runaway slave who's become a Christian. Roman and Mosaic law of the Old Testament gave Philemon the right to punish a runaway slave who was considered property. But the covenant of grace through the Lord Jesus allowed both master and slave to fellowship in love on an equal basis in the body of Christ. And it's a wonderful gospel. Isn't this a wonderful gospel? Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Paul appeals on behalf of Onesimus, reminding Philemon of Jesus' teaching, prompting him to put into action what he'd learned and experienced in order to do the right thing, in order to experience more of the blessings and the treasures of God. Paul says, I could order you, Philemon, to do this. In Christ, it would be right that I said to you, and this, uh, that Onesimus should come back to you and you should accept him as a brother. It would be right for me to do so. 
But Paul wants Philemon to respond with his heart, with the fruit of discipleship. What does that mean? What does fruit of discipleship mean? Well, if I go to an apple tree, I expect to find apples. Yeah? So if I go to a Christian, I expect to find the likeness of Jesus. And that's what Paul's saying. Philemon, I'm coming to you. You know me. You know that you've been discipled by me. You know what the heart of Christ is. I'm expecting to find the heart of Christ in you, Philemon. And Paul knows he is because he's confident in it. It says so. Paul is looking for forgiveness, kindness, mercy, grace and love. He's looking for the heart of the Lord Jesus to come through. This is how we should be with one another as we train and encourage each other in the ways of Christ, as friends and brothers and sisters together. Challenging, not forcing. Okay? Now, if you feel challenged at some point in this, <laughs> I'm not condemning anyone, but if you feel challenged at some point, bear in mind it might not be me who's challenging you. Okay? It might just be God who's saying, yeah, come on, come on. Okay. God wants willing hearts, not forced ones. Of our own free will, we choose to do the correct thing because it's the right thing to do, good and pleasing to God and man. This takes accountability. When we disciple one another in Christ, we bring each other under the authority of Christ. We make ourselves answerable to one another. This is what Paul is doing when he's speaking to Philemon. He's reminding him of his responsibilities in Christ. With this kind of deep relationship that they've got going on here, there's bound to be times needed for correction. And that's the same with us as well. As we go deeper in our relationship, sometimes we see things in each other's lives where we have to say, do you know what, that needs a little bit of correction. Challenging someone can be difficult. It can be difficult for both parties, actually. It's easy to feel upset or rejected when someone rebukes you. This is where the relationship part of this is key. Because, I need a drink. Because, you must remember that the correction is done in love. Because if we learn to live with one another and love one another, that correction is not done to hurt you. It's done to say, come on, come on. This is the heart of Jesus, come on, change. Understanding that correction is in love. Keeping humble and remembering where we've come from and what Christ has done for us. Be gentle and respectful in love as Christ is to us. So what is their relationship like? Well, Onesimus has become a Christian because of Paul's witness and he's grown in faith, big, big faith, due to discipleship. Paul describes him and looks upon him as a spiritual son. Such is the depth of our relationship. What he's saying is there, I brought this man to Christ. He came to Christ because I witnessed to him and, and he's like a son to me. He's grown and he's like this son to me. He uses this description to Philemon because he knows that Philemon will understand that because he's done exactly the same with Philemon. And Philemon will go, oh yeah, I know. Paul, you brought me to Christ. You showed me the wonders of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin. You showed me what it is to follow him. I understand. What it is. Oh, I, understand. I now grasp what this guy is now. He's, he's, he's like me. He's the same. He uses his description because Philemon too is a spiritual son to Paul. He too has come under Paul's wing. He knows and understands Paul's heart. He knows and understands the love and forgiveness of Christ. 
Both men are now brothers, equal in Christ, and Paul is treating them as such. In fact, Philemon is like an older brother to Onesimus. Philemon's been in discipleship for a lot longer and should be more mature in Christ and should, buy, and should be an example to Onesimus. They need easier names, don't they? I want to call him Ollie when I see him. Onesimus, counting the disciple, uh, continuing this discipleship journey together. So when, when Onesimus comes back to Philemon, you know, it's like, okay, well, we continue this discipleship. We'll continue this journey with Jesus together. Paul speaks very highly of Onesimus, sharing how useful he's become as a fellow worker and a companion to Paul. In fact, actually, he compares him to Philemon. You know, I want to keep him here because it's almost as if you're here with me. Here's also a, a wonderful example to us all. No matter what you think of yourself, we are capable and gifted by God, whether we're rich or poor. Now, when, I was, when Tracy read this, she said, well, what, what, what? well, we class now someone as rich as being really educated and capable of teaching. And when we see someone who's poor, now there's this description in our, in our way of living at the moment. If you're poor, you're, you, 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 you know, there's a, the ability to learn isn't as good. It isn't. We're all, we're all the same, okay? We're all people. We're all capable of learning. Rich or poor, strong or weak, intellectual or not, this passage shows us that we can all play our part in discipleship. We can all pass on what we've learned in Christ. That's not difficult. We can all grow to be in the likeness of, the likeness of him, adopted in his family and equal to one another's, sharing the wonders that we've learned in God. Because God only asks us to be a witness of what he's done for us. And that's easy. You just share of what God has done in you. And that's teaching each other about Christ and how to move forward in Christ and how to be a disciple of him. Sharing the wonders of God. Please don't disqualify yourself. I've had conversations with people in this room. I'm not going to look at them again. I've had conversations with people in this room and they say, I'm not good enough to do that. I don't know enough. I, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. I need to know everything there is in the Bible. I need to know everything, every question and every answer. I need to be able to know. I don't know every question and every answer there is. But I do know enough about what God has done in me to share with you, to bring you to Christ. And I know also enough in me to bring you to maturity in Christ. And I'm not... Paul, I'm not intellectually, this takes me, this takes me hours. <laughs> hours and hours of, of heartache to try and put it together. I don't mind doing this bit, I love doing this bit. But I have a love-hate relationship, I love doing this, but I hate putting this together. I'm not intellectual, but I'm capable of sharing the love of Christ with you. And so are you with other people. You are capable of taking other people on and saying, come on, we're on a journey together. We're here now, we're on a journey together. You're here anyway. So come on, let's go together. Let's go together and encourage one another in Christ. Encourage him. The wonders of the sky. A simple, a simple, just bringing that verse suddenly draws me to tears because I realise that this is inside me. This has become me. And it's become you as well. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Oh, I've gone way off of this. Please don't disqualify us. Please don't disqualify yourself. You're just as able to hear from God and apply yourself to the word of God and to prayer and to study. Bring each other on to the greater levels of maturity in Christ. 
Paul applies this whole heart into these two guys. And we're to do the same with one and each, one and each other. Each other. We're to do the same as Paul's done here. There's a mutual respect and love learning from each other as we share our lives together. This is an ongoing thing. Once the discipleship journey has begun, it's a lifetime of friendship. Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon. Again, a discipleship moment. He's modelling to both men the correct behaviour in obedience to the law. Because Onesimus is still owned by Philemon and he's run away. He's demonstrating what it is to be a good Christian witness. Now I'm guessing for Onesimus, turning up at Philemon's door was not an easy thing to do. I can imagine the conversation with Paul. Can you imagine the conversation that takes place here? It's Paul. He says, uh, do you know what, uh, Onesimus, you've been with me quite a while now and um, you've done really well. You're, you're now a Christian and you're helping me greatly but the fact is, you are a runaway slave and you have run away from Philemon. You, uh, you need to go back. And then can you imagine what it's like to be an Isthmus? <coughs> yeah. oh, Paul, I thought I was doing so well. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I've, been, I've been such a help to you. Please, <laughs> please, kind of, why have I got to go back? You know, I ran away. I ran, Paul, I have run away from my owner. He owns me. What am I going to do? What's it going to be like? If you send me back, he's the right to punish me. How, how can this be? I know it's the right thing. I, I know it's the right thing to do because I understand what it is to be a Christian. I understand what God's doing me, but... This is going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult for me. Can you know how Paul would say, it's okay. It's okay. Right. I'll write you a letter. <gasps> Great, that's going to do it. <laughs> no, 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 Onesimus. I know Philemon's heart. I've spent time with him. I, we, disciple, I, we, we discipled one another. I discipled him. I know his heart. I'll send you a letter. And not only will I send you a letter, I will send someone with you. Just in case you get the wobbles on the way there and decide to run again. Because it's possible. You know? And this person will stay with you and he'll encourage you. He's a disciple like you. He'll encourage you. And together you'll go there. Together with this letter and him, you'll stand before, fire, stand before fire Lehman and it'll be okay. And then Anissimus says, do you know what? Okay, I'll go. I know he goes because this letter and the Colossian letter turns up at Colossus. Colossus, Colossus, whatever it is. In the Colossian church, put it that way. There's a commitment on the disciples' behalf to do something. That's where I'm leading. Paul was discipling Anisimus. And there is a responsibility on Onesimus to be discipled. There's a discipline in being discipled. You must turn up. It's a simple thing. Onesimus had to turn up at Philemon's door. You have to turn up, whether that's a specific meeting a house group, a dinner, or simply going for a walk with the person that's discipling you. Anissimus turned up at Philemon's door, a runaway slave. We're not in Anissimus's position of possible punishment because there's grace with us, isn't there? But it's easy in this world to find something else to do, something else to fill your time with. There's always something that wants to pull you away. It's normally this. This old sinful, selfish nature has to be overcome. Jesus has set us free and we have to choose to walk in that freedom. This 
flesh will pull you in all directions. But what I was talking about earlier, when, when I realised that actually inside my first response was, God, you are wonderful. This is amazing. I love you. Can you see the difference between the spirit that's alive and the flesh that wants to pull me in all different directions? When you're being discipled, you need to turn up. You need to be encouraged. You need to learn from one another. We can all get tempted not to meet together and choose to do something else instead. However, when we do meet with God's people, there is a richness in being together. Every time I've come away from a meeting, I come away feeling invigorated and alive because God is in it. Our spirit is alive to God and he does us good. See what is right, do what is right, understand what is good and do what will do you good. Becoming more like Jesus outweighs every other thing and every other stuff that you could possibly cram into your life. I know what it's like to be on both sides of this, being a disciple and trying to disciple someone. We must also remember in this that someone else is giving up their time for you. There's a lot of grace needed sometimes when someone disappoints you. When you're taking time out for them, it can be frustrating and heart-wrenching when they don't turn up. I don't know why I looked at you then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, gra- I'm gently reminding us of our responsibilities to play our part in this. It takes time, dedication, responsibility and effort. If someone gives of their time to get to know you and share their life with you, maturing you in Christ, then put your heart into it. They're trying to do you good. What's Paul saying there? You know, Philemon, you lost Onesimus for a while, but it was in the providence of God that he went because he bumped into me. He now knows the Lord. He's a change man. Once he was useless to you, now he's useful. Once he was no good to you, now he's good for both of us. In fact, he's a great blessing. Paul wants to keep him around. Such is his commitment to him. He offers to pay back his debts, demonstrating his commitment to see the relationship between these two brothers restored. Commitment from Paul comes to a cost at Paul. The commitment from Paul comes at a cost to Paul If there's any debts that he owes, I'll pay them. Paul's confidence in knowing the character of both of them is so clear and that only comes from a good relationship that takes time and effort. I don't know whether the band could come back because I'm coming into land here. There's joy in discipleship. It's a wonderful thing helping others to follow Christ. Finding out more about God together. When someone that you're discipling improves and grows and flourishes in Christ, it's inspiring, it lifts you, it encourages you, it brings great joy to you. It's almost as good as leading someone to Christ, actually. In fact, it's very similar. You're just witnessing to the things that you've learned in Christ. When you help someone to find Jesus for the first time, you're kind of discipling them along the way. You're showing them what you know in Christ. And when they hear the words of God, it gives them faith. In the same way, when we disciple one another, we share with one another the words of God, helping to present them fully mature in Christ. Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's a promise of Christ. I am with you. Go. Make disciples of. Evaluate your relationship with God and ask him to show you how to grow in love with him. How to show and how to grow in your love with him. I'll rephrase that because I've said that all wrong. Evaluate your relationship with God and ask him to show you how to grow in your love with him. Take a look at your relationships and see if there are some individuals who you can go deeper with in discipleship, inviting them to be part of your life. It's an ongoing commitment to God and each other. You learn to like, trust and then love one another. Working and doing life together, confident in each other's character in Christ. In the long run, you'll be glad you got serious about discipleship. I'm done. Yeah, stand, shall we? What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this i hold my hope is only jesus for my life is wholly bound to his oh how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me the night is dark The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For I my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me Through the deepest valley he will lead Oh, the night has been won and I shall overcome Yet not I, but through Christ in me No fate I dread, no fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. All oh, the chains are released, I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, with every breath, 
I long to follow Jesus For he has said that he will bring me home And day by day I know he will renew me Until I stand with joy before the throne To this I hold my hope is only Jesus All the glory evermore to Him When the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat Yet not I, but through Christ in me When the race When the race is complete Still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. of your heart Paul pointing out that forgiving heart just as we go just as we finish maybe that just right now you would covenant before the Lord there's maybe something you've been holding against another and you might even feel that some of those things have been a bit justified. But the Lord is reminding us again of his grace and his mercy shown to us. It may be that you just need right now to say, Lord, all that you have forgiven me, and I've been holding something against another, and I just need to forgive them, I need to release them into your just and righteous hands that you will do what's right. But I, I give them to you. It may be that actually there are those that you just need to receive. Philemon need to, needed to have that receiving heart, didn't he, as the door got knocked to receive him back. Who do you need to receive again? Who do you need to go again with, to walk with? Lord, there's been much for us to hear this morning, much to us to reflect on. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you deal kindly with us. We thank you for your, your heart towards us. But Lord, we also pray by the power of your spirit, will you enable us to respond? Will you enable us to walk in obedience? Will you enable us to display Jesus? We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We receive again your help, your strength to be all that you're calling us to be. Thank you for Rob's message. We pray your blessing upon him and Tracy and upon their marriage. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for uh, what he shared with us. I pray, Lord, that even this afternoon he will just feel your peace resting on him as he's discharged, Lord, all the effort he's put in. Lord, may he be blessed. Thank you for him. Thank you for him, Lord. All God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, do, make sure you greet one another before you rush off to your suntan. But uh, uh, great to see you and uh, look forward to meeting in the week and next Sunday.